Welcome to the Engrafted Word with a mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, making disciples of all men, teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded, preaching righteousness, holiness, and the pursuit of consecration, without which no man shall see the Lord. Presented by Engrafted Word Church. And now, Pastor Christopher McMichael. What a day to live in. And yet, as uh, Mordecai told Esther, maybe you were born for such a time as this. So if you're alive, God knew when he was going to breathe into your spirit or your spirit into that body that was conceived by your mom and dad, that you would be alive in this day. And yet he has invested in you wherever you have been in your Christian walk for the last 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, or maybe five months. He's invested in you what you have need of for the day that we're living in. Now, whether or not we made the most of that investment is another question altogether. I would hate to, do tr to get training on something and not pay attention and then be called upon to demonstrate that training. That's why even in the natural, if you're being trained, you should focus and make the most out of it uh, and, and realize that you're in that season for a special purpose if you're learning CPR, bless God, get in there and be the one that knows how to resuscitate Annie. If you're getting training on a tool at the church, or excuse me, at work, make sure you, you get the most of it. And when you come to church or open up your Bible or go to a Bible study, don't let that be wasted time. Don't get 2%. Don't get 10%. Get everything out of that time of training because you don't know when you're going to need it. And this season that we're living in has come upon the whole earth. It's the first time I've ever seen anything in my short life or have read about even in modern history that has come upon the whole earth like this. World War II might be the closest, but it did not affect the whole earth like this is, and it did not shut down production of anything. It ramped up production of everything, and yet it only lasted four years, and the world marched on. The governments weren't even in agreement in those days. They were fighting against each other. Today, we have the entire world shut down. Uh, we have a billion people in quarantine right now or in lockdown around the world with more countries to follow and more states probably to follow. And yet we have a contradictory message coming out of some media. To, to me, there seem to be two major players right now in our country. Those that are hoping and praying this thing gets worse. They feed off of the fear. The, the, the media feeds off of the fear. They have to keep producing headlines that sound horrific, like how, how much worse can it get? How much worse can the economy drop? How many more people can we cross our fingers and hope to die? And then you got other folks on the other end say, this thing's a ruse. This thing's a sham. The more we crunch numbers, the lower the mortality rate of this thing. What is the deal? We've been suckered here. We've been snookered. So we got these two things going on right now, and then here you and I are having to stream church. We, we're Christians. We want to preach the gospel, enjoy our lives, raise our babies. That's what we want to do. And yet here we are caught up in the opening ceremonies of the last days. Welcome, welcome to the parade for the last day's events. You get the front row seat. I would not waste any more training any more training opportunities from the Word of God, from discipleship. I would be training your children in the ways you've been trained so that they can survive. Because even if we outlive this, or excuse me, this thing outlives us and we pass away of old age, your kids won't. They're going to have to be here for a generation or two after you. you got to make sure they catch it as well. I want to give you a couple scriptures about how maybe best to do church like this since we don't know when this will stop. Could be, come Wednesday, we have the all clear. Could be Wednesday, six months from now. But I want to give you a verse. Go to Isaiah 58 with me. I'm, I'm so proud of many of you who've contacted me. Uh, if you haven't contacted me, it doesn't mean I'm not proud of you. I just haven't heard from you, so I don't mean to uh, slide anybody. But without me saying anything, a lot of you have told me, Pastor, if we go online, I'm dressing my family up. We're wearing our clothes, and we're going to get in front of the television or the uh, the." Um, Computer, and we're going to do church as best we know how in our suit and ties. I'm going to dress my kids up. You basically said we refuse underwear church. We refuse seeker-friendly church. <laughs> I'm proud of you for wearing your church clothes at home. I guess seeker folks are wearing their church clothes at home too, but that's really their home clothes that they just wear to church. I want to give you a passage here out of Isaiah 58 to encourage you that as long as we have to do church this way, that your heart will make all the difference and how much God shows up 
in your living room altar or however you're doing it, your basement, your bonus room. Everybody's a little different. Isaiah 58, I'm going to read this to you out of the NIV because it helps bring some things out a little bit better. Verse 13, and the whole passage is about tithe, excuse me, um, fasting and the kind of fasting God will and won't accept. And it's all about the heart of honor and the heart of sacrifice and the heart of inconvenience. That's what makes fasting acceptable to God versus it just being starvation. And the idea of honor and sacrifice and discomfort is carried over into the next two verses, 13 and 14, which is the heart of how I want you guys to practice church at home as long as we have to do it this way. Verse 13 says, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, which is what we're, we call in church, and from doing as you please on my holy day, for us that's Sunday, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, this has been my biggest bone of contention with Dress Down Church. It calls the Lord's day dishonorable and it calls that dishonor acceptable because some folks refuse to come to church if they have to dress up. That is their problem and is not my problem. If clothing is what keeps you out of the presence of God, you'll go to hell in shorts, okay? I don't know how else to put it. We honor God. Serving God is to be an inconvenience on every aspect of our life. But when we get a heart for it, it is a willing sacrifice. If you will delight in the Lord's holy day and call it honorable, and if you will honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. When you're willing to do this, you'll dress up in your best to honor God. That's all we're asking for. So you can stream these services and just have it playing in the background while you do the dishes or clean the kitchen. Don't do that. That's dishonorable. This is our holy day. This is our sacred Sabbath. I know it's not the Jewish Sabbath of Saturday, but it is our Sabbath as a church. If you're doing dishes right now, stop and make this thing holy ground. Stop doing as you please and give God all your focus and all your time and all your attention. If we're going to make this our service, this is how we have to do it at home. And if you honor it by not going your own way and doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph. I like that. I like that promise. You honor God, he will cause you to ride in triumph. That's a good verse we need in this day. No matter what's going on, I ride in triumph everywhere I go. He will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land. And to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So here's what I recommend. And most of you are already doing it because you are trained gospel warriors. When we do these services, let's treat them at home like we're here in the house of God. Because the more your heart sees it that way, the more God will show up in your living room, in your basement, in your bonus room, on your back sunroom as the sanctuary of God. God doesn't need a house to manifest in. He needs a holy heart. God showed up on Mount Horeb when Moses took his shoes off. God showed up with Joshua when he took his shoes off. God showed up uh, for, for Jacob and he took some rocks, the things of comfort, his pillar, the rock that he used as a pillow. He took the things of comfort and made an altar out of it and said, this is the house of God, the portal of heaven. And God showed up there. So don't do this. This is not pajama church. God will not meet you at pajama church, not when you've been trained better. This is holy house of God. You have your Bible there. You've got your children there. They're dressed up. Wednesday service, we'll treat it like Wednesday service. Everybody's coming from work. We're a little bit more casual. But you will get as much out of these services as you put into it. And if this is just another service you stream, God's not going to be able to do for you the things he wants. And right now, we need to find joy in the Lord and we need to ride in triumph on the heights of the land. Amen. All right. So with that being said, let's go to Galatians 3. I want to talk about a few things about the promises and the covenant of God. I'm going to try to make this equal parts encouraging and equal parts convicting. One of my jobs as a pastor, this is like the unpopular job, I'm to call people to repentance. And until you've ever pastored or been responsible for God's people, you don't, you don't understand the burdens that we as God's shepherds carry. You don't understand what it's like for the Lord to place a burden upon you for a person, an individual, a family, a, a nation, a city, a ministry, and you don't get to shake it. And when you open your mouth, nothing but that burden comes out. 
And that sometimes upsets people because they're the burden. The Bible says we're to remove burdens, not be the burden. And so as a pastor watching my nation walk through what I call passive judgment, watching our wealth be depleted in a week, watching four years of gains and trillions of dollars go away, watching what will be two and a half million people file for unemployment next week who were gainfully employed three days ago, that's passive judgment in my estimation. And it's because our nation has turned from God. So one of the things I have to do as a pastor to those that will listen to me is call people back to repentance. That includes every one of you in this church, even the mature ones, even my elders, even my deacons, even those that are close to us. There's always an arena somewhere where we're not obeying as best we can. And we've got to make that right. Every one of us every week has to forgive somebody. We have to forgive aught. We have to walk in love. There's always something that has to be done to obey God. And Anytime something falls apart, we need to be evaluating, where can I obey my God better? Not out of fear, out of love for him. When you're grossly backslidden, we will save you by fear. We will, we will warn you of God's judgment and wrath and destruction. And my only tools I have are words. And uh, when I read the major prophets, the minor prophets, and even the Lord, they didn't like his warnings. They didn't like the prophet's warnings. And the warnings were always to God's people. The worst enemy to the preacher is not the devil or the pagans. In the times of Israel, in the times of Christ, and in the times of the early apostles, most of the worst enemies were God's own people. And I understand that pretty well. <laughs> so to review quickly last week, we, we said that we ought to take advantage of this weird season we're in. Everybody I'm listening to, everybody I'm following, everybody I'm talking to, preachers, that's who I listen to. We're all hearing and saying the same thing across denominational lines. This is a weird day. We all agree this is a test run for the Antichrist. This is a test maneuver. Apparently, it only takes seven days to shut down the world. And if we practice this again in five years, we could probably do it in half the time. You're seeing what I believe to be a conditioning of everybody staying at home and nobody fighting about it. And then we have the social pressure that comes to shaming those who won't comply with everybody else. It's, I would have never thought my nation that was birthed in rebellion, shaking its fist at tyranny, saying, okay. <laughs> and I'm not telling us to rebel. I'm not telling us to go out there and have street parties. We have one, two, three, four, five, six people in this sanctuary right now. So we're complying, but I just never would have thought you could make America just give up in seven days and say, let's stay at home and lose our jobs and wait for the government to bail us out. I'm just making an observation. We're living in a weird day, and as I said last Sunday and even Wednesday, this is a test run to see where the world is with its doctrine on borders. Apparently, the world still believes in nationalism. When you shut down your borders and say, we're going to take care of ours and ours only, and everybody outside's a threat, that is the definition of nationalism. And apparently, the whole world still holds that doctrine. So... I believe if I am the Antichrist, i got to fall back and work on that some more so that when this thing happens again, we don't close our borders because if I'm the Antichrist, I need a global government. We're also seeing how easily people are peer pressuring one another so that we don't have to police it. I mentioned that Wednesday night talking about we're seeing a test run on the power of social media and the ability to pressure people into obeying the government so the police don't have to get involved. That night, I went home. I read a quote from President Trump. They said, many folks aren't obeying your orders. What do you say to them? He says, well, I, can't, I don't like that they're not obeying. He said, but what we're seeing is that others are putting pressure on them, and it is self-policing. I said, I read that about midnight Wednesday night. I said, I just taught that, that that was going to happen. And here it is already in an interview. And then, of course, there's been a lot of observations since then. So it's a weird day. And what you and I have to do as believers is draw closer to Jesus Christ. No excuses, no challenge, no delay, which are the rules in my household for my children. When we give them a, a command or when we ask them concerning obedience, our children, they're probably quoting it right now at home. No delay. No excuse, no challenge. And if I'm training my kids to do that, don't you know God's looking at his church and saying, when I give you a command, church, no excuse, no delay, no hesitation. You just do it. You just march. So one of the things I said last week is coming to church gives you a spectrum of Christian-like experience, and you've got to make sure you're where you need to be on that spectrum. 
And the spectrum's very easy, just four steps, just to review. Coming to church gives you Christian knowledge. You can go to hell with Christian knowledge because it doesn't save you. It has the ability to save you. It can make you wise into salvation, but it can't save you. You have to believe and receive salvation through Christ alone. A lot of folks go to church, all they have is Christian knowledge. Or you can use that Christian knowledge and you can build the next step on the spectrum, a belief system, a belief framework. A lot of folks go to church. This is the modern problem we're facing with our young people. They're brought to church. Their parents love God. Their parents sacrifice for God. But something's mi missing in the ingredients. There's something missing in the formula because the kids grow up with a Christian uh, uh, belief system. But when they get to college or they leave home or they get around somebody at the high school or at the home school, that belief system is challenged by a pagan. And because the belief system is only a culture they've adopted and not embraced, their belief system is easily deconstructed. And like the DNA lattice, when you begin to make DNA changing with the CRISPR, the CRISPR the, the, there's a genetic thing called a CRISPR when you splice DNA. If we're looking at our Christian faith as a ladder, Pagans come in, they take certain parts out and insert new parts. Take rungs out, insert their new parts. So before long, we have Christians that believe in gay marriage. We have Christians that don't believe the validity of the entire Bible. We have Christians that mock eschatology. We have Christians that mock tongues that were raised in tongue-talking churches. This is their belief system being deconstructed because they've never moved on to the third step on the spectrum, which is conviction. If you don't ever take your Christian belief system and have a conviction of it, you're not really going to move to the fourth stage, which is lifestyle change. So your four steps in the spectrum are knowledge, belief system, conviction, lifestyle change, or change life. I understand Muslim, I have a, I, I have a Muslim belief system. I understand what they believe. I, I, I got it. And right here in this hand, I get the general idea of Islam. I get the general belief system of, of Mormonism, but they're not my convictions and they're not my faith. I can get those belief systems by going to their services, by studying books about them, by talking with Muslims in airports around the world or in other countries, and I, I get it, I get it. It's not my conviction. And so this corona thing is showing us where we're at on that spectrum. Is it just Christian knowledge? Is it just a belief system? Or do we have a conviction and a changed life? Because where you fall on the fear spectrum, where you fall in your day-to-day -day walk, that's revealing whether this is just a a theoretical belief system, or whether this is a practical, applied conviction and lifestyle change. Because if you have got a conviction of this, you're actually kind of excited about where we're at. You're like, yeah, opening day, day opening day of the apocalyptic Olympics. Apocalympics. That's what I'm going to call this now. I just made this up. Apocalympics. We are in the opening ceremonies of the apocalyptic. In fact, let's call this service that, Gertie. The opening ceremonies of the apocalyptics. We'll figure out how to spell it once I'm done preaching here. If you've been training, you're excited. This is what you've been training for. Forget Japan 2020, Apocalympics 2020. And this is where you realize how much you really believe God, how much you believe the scriptures, how much you believe the promises of God, how much you believe you have authority, how much you believe in the name of Jesus, how much you believe you have authority over the spirit realm, how much you believe in the provision of God, how much you believe in the scriptures and God's promises. This is where you prove that. If you're falling apart, if you're still worried about your kids' gymnastics or soccer or tuba practice, you're still bummed about your vacation or the fact that you can't be at school with your friends, you have not been training for the Apocalympics. We have been. I'm excited for it. And there's no fear in my home. There might be a little bit of cabin fever a little bit, but we're getting over that. We're kind of settling into this thing, whether it lasts another week or some say six months. Who knows? But it's apocalyptic time. I'm excited. Knowledge, belief system, conviction, lifestyle change. We want to be in this conviction, lifestyle change into the spectrum. And it's our job as parents to put that in our kids. Uh, I'm, I'm, somebody said, I was brought up, I had a drug problem. Whoa, whoa, what kind? I was drugged to church. That was my problem. I'm thankful my parents drugged me to church, Baptist church, Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday night, RAs, uh, Baptist youth camp where I got born again, drugged to Seattle, had a drug problem out there, was drugged to church there, drugged to these evangelical Lutherans, did missionary work with Lutherans, and that got in me. 
My parents lived it and they practiced it. My mom sang hymns at home. She always played the piano. We had our own tithing envelopes as Baptist kids. I'm thankful that was practiced in front of me. Now, there's other things my parents did that have caused me to have therapy sessions now, but that's a joke because I know they're streaming right now. At least they should be because if they can't go to their Baptist church, they should at least listen to their son. (laughs) We ought to be putting these convictions in our kids. We ought to be putting this, this word in them so that they don't just have our faith but they actually have uh, our convictions and they catch our heart. They catch our heart for the gospel. Our faith has to be their faith. When God met each of his patriarchs, he said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. He didn't say I was your God yet. And then he shows up to Jacob, says, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham and Isaac. He wasn't Jacob's God yet. And when God shows up to our kids, he will in one way spiritually introduce himself as I'm the God of your mom and dad. I'm the God of your pastor. Can I be your God? That has to be how we raise our kids. I want to be honest with you, parents of teenagers, I still have a burden for our teenagers and I don't know what in the world to do with it. Maybe these apocalyptics can help us. (laughs) So that brings me to Galatians 3. And this is where I want to encourage you. As I was thinking this week about everything we're watching unfold, there's two fears in the earth right now. One is sickness. The other is loss of wealth, unemployment, basically provision. An attack on health and an attack on provision. Two problems. An attack on health, which is the coronavirus, killing everybody over the age of 80 with two and three pre-existing pulmonary issues. (laughs) And the subsequent secondary attack on wealth, because you shut down the nations, all the Western ones, and then you have trickle-down Reaganomics on speed with the turbo boost and 21 gigawatts of power, and now all of a sudden we're in a recession in seven days when you're supposed to have two quarters of contraction in the economy before you declare recession. So we got two freak-out shows right now, sickness and disease and provision. And as I was meditating on that, thinking about it and where we're at as a nation and what my job is as a pastor to help our church, I was reminded of listening to Brother Hagin teach in 1996. I only saw Brother Hagin once in person alive before he passed away, but I was given five tapes of Brother Hagin from a faith seminar from the early 90s, and I listened to those tapes over and over and over again. Now, for for some of you born like in the 90s and 2000s, what a tape is, is this plastic thing called a cassette. I don't even know, a cassette sounds French to me. I don't even know what that means in French. But it was plastic. It's about this big, just a little bit bigger than a credit card. And it had a magnetic reel of tape on it. That's why they were called tapes. Magnetic tape. It looked like this chocolate brown color. And and it got 45 minutes. A 90-minute tape was a big deal because that meant 45 minutes on each side. You had the A side and the B side. And you'd put this tape and you'd have a magnetic transposer that you would dub... You dub whatever was on the copier to these tapes. We still have these dubbers here at the church. We still give tapes out to the inmates. They're getting harder and harder to find. So it's a magnetic audio imprinted on this magnetic tape. And so what you do is you'd listen, and then you'd hear the tape player. You'd listen for 45 minutes. The tape player would click. You'd hit eject, open the thing, flip the tape around, close it, hit play again, and then the magnetic tape would play and read the other side, you get the other 45 minutes of the sermon. In those days, messages were an hour and a half because the American church was hungry for God. Now we have since distilled them down to 22 minutes, eight minutes of worship, four minutes for offering, text to tithe, and we're out in an hour. (laughs) You didn't need a real tape for those kind of services. That's why tapes went away. (laughs) In those days, you could literally wear a tape out which meant you listened to that message so much, you scrubbed the magnetic audio off the tape. You just played it so much, the magnetic file, it's not a file, the magnetic imprint on that tape just wore out, and you'd have to go back and get another one. So in those days of the healing and teaching revivals, we wore tapes out, literally. They were no good. You couldn't listen to them anymore. They got garbly. They, they just, you couldn't even hear it. It was so listened to. I wore out these five Brother Hagen tapes. 
by listening to them over and over again all day, every day. I could quote you the one sermon about Deuteronomy 28 and the, the blessing of Abraham and the curse of the law, which is what I want to minister to you about. And I listened to Brother Pagan teach that over and over and over again because I had to grasp this doctrine that I had not been taught growing up. And that was a simple premise that under Christ, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That's Galatians chapter 3, about verse 11 or 12. As it is written, cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. So one of the things Brother Hagin pointed out over and over and over again is that the curse of the law was threefold. And this is what I want to throw you, and then we're going to look at something else. Under the law, if you violated the law of God, you were counted as God's enemy, and you went to hell when you died. So the first curse of the law was spiritual death and separation from God. Now, now granted, if we were to distinguish even more severely or, or parse it and dissect it, you were already spiritually dead at the age of accountability when you were five, eight, ten years old and you rebelled against mom and dad knowing not to, you would have died spiritually then. But because of God's covenant in the earth, under those days, if you died trusting in God, believing on the coming Messiah after that had been revealed through the law and through the teachings of the prophets, you would go to Abraham's bosom and await the manifestation of the Son of God and the preaching of the gospel when he descended into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and preached into captivity and led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, preached the spirits that were in prison as Peter and as Ephesians and as Acts talk about. You were held in Abraham's bosom in paradise in Sheol until the day of redemption. You still got to go to heaven. That's the first curse of the law. You and I are born again now. We've been redeemed from that curse, praise God. But the other two parts of the curse of the law, we ought to take courage in because we've been redeemed from them too. The second curse of the law, according to Deuteronomy 28, is sickness and disease. When you look at the curse of the law, well, Deuteronomy 28 gives you a big length of 60-something verses on the blessings and the curses of the law. When you kind of distill all those curses down, it summarizes into two things. Sickness and disease, poverty, lack. So the threefold curse of the law, according to the Torah, is separation from God, sickness and disease, and no provision. Thank you for joining us today. We trust that the preaching has been a delight and blessing to your soul. Be sure to join us every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on this station for the preaching of God's Word. For more information, contact our website at www.ingraftedword.org or call our toll-free number 